Good morning. Happy New Year. Welcome to our Lord's Day services, first edition for 2011. Thankful for your presence this morning. We'll begin with number 33. 33. Sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Count your blessings before our scripture reading and prayer. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking of his loss, count your many blessings now. your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. We'll read verses 1 through 10 before our prayer. Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. <clears throat> For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting and let us not be weary in well doing 
but in due season we shall faint if we shall reap rather if we faint not as you have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are the household of faith would you bow as we pray Father, we thank you so much for the precious word that you've left for us. As we enter this new year of service unto you and our fellow man, Father, we pray that we will pay close attention to that word, that we will pattern our lives as best we can after your Son and our Savior, Jesus. We thank you for this land and the good that it does, and we beg your forgiveness for times when we in our land do not do that which is right. Bless the leaders that they might lead us in such a way that a miracle will once again be looked upon as a good and honest leader of the world. Father, as we enter this new year, may we do all that we can to further that cause. But especially, Father, help us to live our lives in such a way that those around us can see the example of Jesus in our lives. Forgive us where we have bad thoughts. Forgive us where we lose our temper. Forgive us, Father, where we do not do that which you would have us do as we live our daily lives. Bless our men and women who are serving this country in foreign fields, even in areas where their lives are in jeopardy. Bless the families that they've left behind. We pray, Father, if it be your will, they and those families will be soon reunited. Father, we thank you for the good leadership of our congregation here. May you bless them in this new year. As they lead us, as they challenge us to come up to the potential that we believe that we have. Forgive us where we've erred. We thank you for the precious blessing of your son who died through no cause of his own but for us. Bless us as we strive to serve you and him. We humbly pray in the name of that Savior, Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen. Again, we welcome you and say good morning. Thankful for this opportunity to join together for our Bible study period. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adult classes.
in 1 John chapter 1, we somewhat introduced this letter thus far and began to look at the text itself. We'll continue that study this morning. It is good to see each of you here today, beginning a new year. Hopefully our, our new year will hold good things for us here as individuals as well as the congregation of, of God's people. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, Declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. First four verses. First John chapter 1. When you read these first three verses, it's almost as if John is repeating himself which we've seen, heard, handled, so forth. He goes back over it. He goes back over it. Of course, one of the things that characterizes the writing of John, as we emphasize by way of introduction, is to enhance one's appreciation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You'll recall in the book of John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, He said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. For what reason? That you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. And so there is uh, at least a dual purpose for John's writing both in the Gospel according to John as well as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, Revelation, which John wrote, is a little different. But uh, the four letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Gospel according to John, are all written to enhance one's concept of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, as John begins this letter, and he begins the Gospel according to John much the same way, How does he begin? He presents himself as what? As a witness. As a witness. What does it take to be a witness? Well, obviously you have to be in the presence of. And he states that two or three times. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. Then in verse 2, which we have, uh, we have seen it and bear witness. Then in verse 3, which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. So at least three times in these three verses, John declares that he is a, a true and worthy witness because he has seen, he has heard, he has handled. He's been in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If there's anything that we ought to be able to determine from such statements as John makes in these three verses, how does it make you feel or what does it make you think when somebody wants to refer to themselves as a witness today? 2,000 years removed from the time that our Lord was here on this earth. We can speak of things that God has done for us in our lives. But when you think about the concept of a witness, you remember whenever uh, there was to be a replacement for Judas in the apostleship. What was important? at least a couple of things that were important for the one who would take 
Judah's place. That he had been there. That he had been witness to some of those things. And of course, uh, Paul refers to himself as one born out of, out of Bhutan. But nevertheless, he had some time spent on this earth. At least in close proximity to the Son of God. And of course, later was able to see some things on that road to Damascus that others were not able to see or hear. But here is a witness, one who has seen. You go to court and you, you decide or you determine or you present yourself as a witness to whatever the situation is. What's going to be the point of interest to the judge or those who are trying to establish credible witnesses? Were you there? Did you see it with your own eyes? Well, no, but I tell you what, I've been reading the papers pretty close. I, you know, I know what the talk of the town is. Does that make you a good witness? Now that'll get you kicked out. So whenever people talk about today witnessing, what have you witnessed? The only thing you're going to witness in your life is what God has done for you through your obedience to the gospel the forgiveness of your sins, the opportunity to be a child of God, but as far as anything otherwise, absolutely not. You weren't there. You didn't see. You didn't hear. You didn't feel what John did. Why would John in this regard talk about, um, he, uses, he uses this statement in verse 1, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Why would he use that expression? Our hands have handled. Huh? Yeah, but why that particular expression? Hands have handled. <clears throat> you think John had actually touched our Lord? Do you remember an occasion where Jesus met with some of the disciples, and one was absent. Who was that one that was absent on Sunday night? Thomas. You ever wonder what if you miss on, on Sunday night, what you're going to miss? Uh, <clears throat> Thomas missed something that Sunday night, didn't he? But it was reported to him who had been in their presence. And what did Thomas say? Till I see him with my eyes and till I feel those prints in his hands, I won't believe him. Did he have that opportunity? Yeah. Credible witness. Hear, see, feel. And that's the importance of when you, when you began reading the gospel according to John and, and you began reading 1 John, don't just read through these verses as if they're there just to kind of introduce the letter. They're not. Everything that John says after verses 1, 2, and 3 of 1 John and after verses 1, 2, and 3 according to the Gospel of John are going to be dependent upon what? His being a true witness. His having been there, having seen, having heard, having handled of the word of life. And so when we think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, no, we weren't there. We didn't see Him. We didn't hear Him. We didn't handle Him. So how do we know that He exists? Because there are credible witnesses to His existence. When you begin to think about the, the, the realm of evidences with regard to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whether, whether he really was a real character or not, you have the credible witness John in that regard. And so we looked at those, some of those expressions, heard, seen, handled, so forth, in our previous study a couple of weeks ago. And so John's testimony here concerning the word of life the word of life. For the life was manifested, 
And again, look at the expression. We have seen it, bear witness, show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Look at the expressions that John uses to either refer to or characterize Jesus Christ. He refers to him in verse 1 as the word of life. Now go back to the beginning of the gospel according to John. How does John begin that book? In the beginning was the word. Well, if you have any problem figuring out to whom he is referring, all you've got to do is keep on reading in that context. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then you come on down to verse 14, and what does he say? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He further describes Him in that regard. And, of course, then the rest of the book, that is, the Gospel according to John, is, is written to uh, explore and provide evidence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, so that those who would read that letter could believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And so here he refers to him in the same way, as the word of life. What's the significance of Jesus being referred to as the word of life? Well, he said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. He is the source, is he not, of life. What life is there without Jesus Christ? Oh, there's physical life. But when's that going to end? Soon. I don't care what generation you talk about. Your life is going to end soon, relatively speaking. Whether it's 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, 90 years. Relative to the rest of time and eternity, that's relatively soon, isn't it? But with regard to Jesus Christ, He's the Word of life. He can give something that will continue, that's worthwhile. He's the source of life. That's the thing that He's uh, dealing with in this regard. So, so we're not talking about some myth. We're not talking about some, some thought in somebody's mind somewhere of this character. We're talking about a living figure, Jesus Christ. The Son of God, the source of life. In John 11, he is referred to as the life. In John chapter 6, he's referred to as the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he's referred to as the light of life. So everywhere you turn in John's writings, there are references to Christ and his connection to life. No life without Christ. So he's not merely a thought or a message, but actually in the flesh. The Word became flesh. John 1, 14. And so again in verse 2, for the life was manifested. He's referred to as the Word of life, verse 1. Verse 2, the life was manifested. We've seen it. Bear witness, show unto you that eternal life. Now, he's expanded his thought a little bit. He's referred to him as the word of life. He says that the life was manifested, which we've seen, heard, so forth. Now he refers to him as what? Eternal life. Eternal life. We show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Still he's referring to Jesus Christ. Now he refers to him as eternal life. Why so? Why would he refer to him as eternal life? Because he is. Because he is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Now those expressions should not be uh, too strange to us. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. 
God. Who's that a reference to? What we would refer to as the Godhead. I would suspect that most of the time when we read beginning in Genesis 1 and we see that word God, we probably think about God the Father more than anything else, don't we? But as you read down through the context, in the beginning God created, oh well, now let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. Who was it that did the creating? Jesus did. Jesus Christ. So back here, is that a contradiction that God created Genesis 1, Jesus created Colossians 1? No contradiction. Why? Because the word God is not a proper name in that it's referring to one personality over another. In Genesis 1, as we've often noted, it is a plural form that would incorporate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three personalities that make up the Godhead. Who is in the midst of that? This one of whom John is writing right here. So that's why he could refer to it as eternal life, because he is eternal, has no beginning. Now he had a beginning as far as his fleshly existence was concerned, born of the Virgin Mary. But that wasn't his beginning. The Word, John 1, 14, the Word did what? Became, he already was, but he became flesh. It's not his beginning, it's a change of form for him. Became flesh. So that's why he refers to him as, as eternal life in this regard. And so that eternal life we've, we've showed unto you. What's John doing in his letter? He's showing to these people Jesus Christ, the Son of God, trying to, to make that, that firm impression in their minds. Who is this one that we're serving? He's Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the eternal one the eternal being. He's the one who is the source of life, which was with the Father. Now you go back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. God the Father, God the Son, existent together at that point in time and eternity. and was manifested unto us. Now that's just another way of saying we've seen him, we've heard him, we've touched him. He was made manifest, he was made known to us. John, a credible witness. Then in verse 3, look at what he says, that which we have seen and heard. Is that new? No, here's that credible witness speaking again. So what we've seen and heard Declare we unto you. And then he gets into the purpose of his letter. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What's John interested in? He's interested in fellowship, isn't he? Now the word fellowship here is is not a bean supper, folks. We use the word fellowship in such loose terms like we do a lot of other terms. And there is fellowship to be enjoyed over a common meal. But far too often, that's about the only way we use the word anymore, is relative to a common meal shared together. There's far more to be shared among those who are in fellowship with God, one to another. And you'll notice in the very next verse, after he talks about fellowship in verse 3, what does he talk about in verse 4? Joy. Joy. Can you imagine for a moment that an individual could understand much of anything about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and about what we really enjoy in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the life that we have in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
and not have joy being in the presence of others who have the same thing. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Why we do not enjoy the fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. You know, if there were no other reason on the face of the earth, no other benefit by our coming together on Sunday night or Wednesday night than just being able to enjoy fellowship one with another, that seems to me would be really sufficient to get us here. That's why it makes me wonder sometimes, do we really enjoy? Do we really understand? Do we really comprehend what we have in Christ? That's what John's trying to get us to see here. What do we have in Christ? We're not talking about a casual relationship here, folks. We're talking about something far beyond that, something that we enjoy in Christ that is of an eternal nature. And so he talks about that fellowship. And that fellowship, of course, You'll notice in the first place, he says, Our fellowship is with the Father. So John, in talking about this matter of fellowship, reaches upward to deity. That's where it all begins. Until there is fellowship with deity, until there is fellowship with God, there is no place for fellowship among folks here on this earth. Not in the sense that John is using the word fellowship here. So, so he reaches upward to deity, then he reaches out to other faithful Christians who are enjoying that same fellowship with deity. We mentioned, I think, previously that we can think about fellowship in somewhat the form of a triangle. That may not exactly look like a triangle, but it's pretty close. Where's our fellowship? My fellowship with God, your fellowship is with God, then we can have fellowship together. What happens if I break my fellowship with God? Then my fellowship with you is going to be broken. Your fellowship with me is going to be broken. And when you look at it from that perspective, when you think about the concept of withdrawing fellowship, and I'm not going to get too far off into that this morning, but I want you to see what's happening here. We have fellowship together because we both have fellowship with God. So when we say to someone, we are withdrawing our fellowship from you, what is that saying to that person? We believe your fellowship with God is disrupted. Well, folks, that's serious business, isn't it? Serious business. Number one, that's why we do not take the withdrawal of fellowship lightly because of the implications involved. But it's also why we need to take it seriously when it is done because if somebody's fellowship with God is in jeopardy, and we treat them like it's not in jeopardy, then we're giving them a false sense of hope. And that's not good for us or them. So we need to see what John is saying here in this matter of fellowship with God and with one another. It has a tremendous impact on our lives on a daily basis. So he wants them to have fellowship. What is the word fellowship anyway? What does that word really mean? All right, one definition that we usually give is joint participation. And so if, if fellowship is joint participation, based upon what? If 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 I'm going to jointly participate with you, and that's going to be genuine fellowship, then what does that say? It says that I'm participating with God in God's way of doing things. Now, 
Maybe we can see from that why it is not possible. I didn't say ought not to be. I said why it is not possible for us to have fellowship with religious people who are in error, not in fellowship with God. We can't jointly participate with them because they're not participating with God. And that's hard for generally religious people to understand. I have had people to say to me, well, you know, if I, if I will, maybe if I invite them to a gospel meeting or whatever, well, if I'll attend with you, sometime down the road, will you will attend with me? Will you attend with me? And I simply say, no, I can't do that. I know a lot of our brethren won't, won't take that stand, but I think we better take that stand. No, I can't participate with you because you're not participating with God. And I'll be glad to study with you and explain why that is the case. But we can't participate with people who are not participating with God. Whether that's other religious organizations or whether it is those of our own brethren who are not participating with God anymore. It works the same way. There can be no fellowship in that regard. So, so unity in faith produces communion in religion. Unity of faith produces communion in religion. That, that's the basis of it. You go back, uh, John, look at John chapter 17. And I've, I've shown you this before, but I think it's so crucial to our understanding of what's taking place here. Go back to John chapter 17. You'll recognize that as Jesus' prayer to the Father. <clears throat> I don't want to begin. I just want to read some select verses here. and I want to emphasize a word to you. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Word of God. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. That's the Word of God. Go up down to verse uh, 14, I have given them thy word. Look in verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. What's the basis of unity? And that's really what John is, John 17 is all about, is unity. Based upon what? The word of God. That's the only basis for unity is the word of God. That's why we cannot, as some would have us to do, why we cannot disregard our differences and work together on whatever common ground we might have otherwise. That's not the basis of unity. It's just some common ground. The basis of unity is the Word of God. And wherever people will not go with the Word of God, we simply cannot go with them. But the beauty, the beauty of that situation is wherever you go, some of you have traveled more than others. Some of you have been with Spin and them on their mission trips to wherever you go, Panama, other places. Some of you have been to other parts of the world. You've traveled. But it doesn't matter where you go. Whenever you find people who are in fellowship with God, what happens? There's just a natural attraction, isn't there? Just a natural attraction. Here are people that you're, you are in love with immediately. Why? Because you're in fellowship with God, they're in fellowship with God, you automatically have fellowship together. You can, you can participate with them. You can have that joint participation with them. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter where you are. That's the way it works. 
So that partnership, that, that joint sharing with Christ, the unity among believers. <clears throat> so you can't separate fellowship with God and fellowship with brethren. It works together. They're tied together. We've got to see that tie that, that binds them together. You know, there's a principle that is mentioned with regard to marriage. Whatsoever God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, that principle worked with marriage, but it also worked with everything else that God has joined together, won't it? Whatever God's joined together. Now, God has joined together fellowship with Him and fellowship with one another. I don't have any right to have fellowship with people that God does not authorize me to have fellowship with. But neither should I separate myself from people with, uh, who are in fellowship with God. It's a beautiful relationship that we enjoy in Christ Jesus, that joint participation. So if you're in fellowship with God and I'm in fellowship with God, why would we not want to work together? Why would we not want to jointly share in our efforts together here on this earth? You see what that does whenever people get bickering and fussing and fighting among themselves and claim to be children of God? See what that does? A fellowship makes us want to work together. It doesn't make us want to fuss and fight with one another. So whenever fussing and fighting and feuding is going on, obviously what's happening? Somebody is forgetting their fellowship with God. And it's affecting their fellowship with brethren. That's a serious situation. One that we don't need to be responsible for if we want to maintain our relationship with God. And so I think you can see right off the bat why these first two or three verses in, in 1 John as well as the Gospel according to John where he places so much emphasis upon Jesus Christ. That's the basis of our fellowship together. If we don't believe in Christ, there's not going to be a basis of fellowship. So then in verse 4, he says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Your joy may be full. You see, joy is produced by fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That brings tremendous joy into our lives. So this is kind of an exclusive realm of joy, isn't it? In John chapter 17 again, in verse 13, Jesus says, And now come out of thee, these things I speak in the world, that they might uh, have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Fellowship with God, fellowship with others who are in fellowship with God brings joy. The entire book of Philippians is a book of joy. So many different aspects of the Christian life Paul mentions in that letter concerning which he says there, there's joy. Chapter 4 and verse 4 is kind of a summation of the entire book. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now with that in mind, think about, for example, in Acts chapter 8. That Ethiopian was riding along and Philip was instructed to join himself to that chariot. Understandest thou what thou readest, he asked. The man said, How can I accept some man should guide me? Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. They came to certain water. He said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And he did what? Went on his way rejoicing. Why? Well, he's got fellowship with God now. As he understands that life in Christ, he now has fellowship with God, and he, under, he knows that fellowship with God now. 
But at the same time, he'd also be in fellowship with Philip at this point, wouldn't he? And any other person that is now in fellowship with God. There's reason to rejoice when we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. So John writes that their joy may be full. He wants them to have and enjoy the same joy that he has. In 2 John, 2 John, chapter, well, only one chapter, verse 4, John says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. We can rejoice when we realize that we're in Christ, like that Ethiopian did. But what's going to maintain that joy? Our continued walking in the light, which is going to maintain our fellowship with God. So as long as we walk in the light, there is every reason to rejoice. So here John is, and he talks about that realm of joy. Here at the, at the close of his life, John's going to write some things and he's going to deal with some false doctrine in these chapters that we're going to look at. So he sees that on the horizon. But he wants these brethren to know what they have, what they have with God in Christ and what they have with one another. A very happy relationship, joint participation, working together because of their relationship with God. All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up there next Sunday.